Good morning, everybody. Here we are at the physics video lecture once again. It's the PSI 168 video lecture 7. And let me write down our agenda for today. You see, we have a bunch of interesting stuff on the table. And I had asked you to look at the Wally Wallington video. I'm going to discuss that and explain it. Let's see. We're going to talk about the lever. So I actually brought some real life examples here. Law of the lever. And from there, um, lever and center of mass. And then I'll just write Wally Wallington Stonehenge. Stonehenge, which is just the greatest demonstration of these principles. And that's going to allow us to get into work, energy, and power. We'll see how far we get. That brings us into the subject matter of our lecture, the title of our lecture, of our class. Um, good. And I think I could use some little bit of extra material from backstage. So I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. stack of weights here and and yet another scale okay here we are okay I wanted to demonstrate the law of the lever and the principle of center of mass and I just brought a nice metal fulcrum and I have a board, okay? So we can actually do everything with this. It kind of repeats what I talked about with the ruler. So first of all, if I can find the point at which the board balances, then that's gonna be its center of mass, okay? And it's, it's an unstable balance, so it tips to one side, tips to the other, and okay, we're basically there. And I've got about 95 centimeters on one side and about the same on the other, okay? So it's right there in the middle. That's not surprising because it's a uniform board. Good. The first thing I'm going to do though is ignore the weight of the board and just set up a classic lever example. So now, in fact, I'm going to do a picture of this as we go along. So we've got this board it's just under two meters long. And right here is where I would stand a person. So let's just draw our picture and carefully label it. So I would stand a person. Here's the board here. I would stand somebody right here, okay? And then I would have another student, someone would be standing here, and I would have a student just push down right there, okay? So what we're going to do is label this and actually measure it and show some numbers. So this is me, and let's just say F1 equals 900 Newtons and good round number, right? An L1 here, I'll specify in a moment. L2 is the distance to this axis, okay? And this is F2. 
Well, this is going to be the, going to be the question mark. Now, this is a real life example that we'll do in class if people are here. So I'll be standing right on this board here. So I have one foot here and the other one here. Actually, let me check the camera before I go on. Here, let's turn this a bit. Good. Okay, good thing I caught that, right? So yeah, I have one foot where each of my hands are placed. Therefore, my center of mass, if I'm standing here, is right in between, okay? Right in between, and I can measure that off, and it is 18 centimeters. I'm just going exactly with what I measure here on the spot. So 18 centimeters, or I can say L1 is equal to 0.18 meters. Okay, so we have that. Now L2 is the distance from the fulcrum all the way to the end of the board because our student colleague is just going to be pressing down at the end of the board. So that's one meter and 55 centimeters. So that's 1.55 meters. So L2 is equal to 1.55 meters. And our question is, how hard does the student volunteer have to push down on this side to lift up the teacher? And you know, in a small enough class, we actually have everyone give this a try. But you'll notice I've actually made the measurements. I'm ignoring the weight of the board now. We can do that because I'm so much more heavy than the board. Okay. So our law of the lever, as we called it, was just the law of the balance. So we had F2 L2 is equal to F1 L1. And we're going to solve for F2, which is what we wanted to know. F2, the second force, is equal to F1 times this ratio, L1 divided by L2. And now I can fill in. I've got my 900 newtons times oh, this one here, 0.18 meters, 0.18 divided by 1.55. Okay, now you could get your calculator out, and you'll notice I didn't have to write the meters because the meters and the meters cancel. Um, get your calculator out, but that's roughly 0.2 divided by 1.6. Okay, so that's eight times, or one eighth. So it's 900 divided by eight. Okay. So this here, let's go ahead and put a box around it. I encourage you guys to, you know, repeat this and actually get those numbers. I'll just write the approximation. I'll put a star right here star we find F2 in this case which is that force there is equal to I don't know right approximately equal to 900 divided by 8 because that's a 1 8 there okay that's a lot less that's what we call mechanical advantage and anybody, any student, can push down with 900 divided by 8. Okay. That's just a little 100 newtons, that's you know, 10 kilograms, is a small fraction of anybody's body weight. Okay. So very easy to do. So go ahead and, and get those numbers. That's um, roughly 110, uh, roughly 11, roughly 11. And that's the example that I wanted to give of the lever. Did the law of the lever and the other part of the law of the lever I can demonstrate here as well um, I'll just put a couple of weights here I don't want well slide off so I'm just going to remind you we had 
the distance here when I push down is going to be much, much greater than the small distance at this end where things are being raised by a certain amount. That would also be the law of the lever. This here was really the law of the balance, just for holding it. But the distances pushed up and pushed down scale in the same way. Okay, so far so good. Let me check my camera angle here. All right, I'm going to swing this back a bit. There we go. So next I'm going to talk about center of mass with my demo objects. Now we already saw the center of mass is right in the geometrical center of the board. What I'm going to do next is weigh the board. So we've got a scale here. First I'll see what it is myself. And then I'll turn it around for you guys. Oh, this thing goes right around 50. So it's just over 50, about 53 newtons. I'll demonstrate that. When I place the board here on the scale, you're going to see that it all it goes all the way through the scale, which would be 50. And uh, I'll check the camera to see if I can read that as well. Passes it up about 53. And if you zoom in, you can probably see that. Good. So we have a 53 Newton board. More, I need to know this fairly accurately. So, yes, 53 newtons. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. I'll set that there for now. Go ahead and erase what we have here. materials that are similar to this at home, this is something I recommend everybody trying with whatever they can scrape together. Get some boards, kitchen scale, and some weights. So what we're going to do now is draw a picture and do a little analysis. So we have this board, I'm going to put the fulcrum towards that end. Okay, so we have a board it weighs a total of 53 newtons and right smack in the middle is where that weight hits. So I'm just going to call this F1 53 newtons. That's the actual uh, board. 53 newtons. So what I want to do is put a fulcrum somewhere here and then balance those 53 newtons. So suppose we put the fulcrum somewhere close to in between. Then how many newtons do we have to stack here in order to balance it? Okay. Well, let's see what I have available for starters. Okay. I have available 10 newtons, 20 newtons, um, or I could take this one right here. No, those are 20 a piece, so that's 20, 40, right? Yes. 20 newtons, I should look here. Yes. So 20, 40. Let's see if we can go get that extra 10 newtons here. Okay, 
Okay, I think I'm in luck. So what do we have here? 40, 45, 50, 55. Okay, so 55 is pretty close to 53. Okay, 55 is close enough to 53. Here's what we're going to do. We know the center of mass of the board. First, I have to locate it again. Is right here. Okay, mark this. There's the center of mass right here. I know where it is now. So that's where I can mark it for you guys. About here. So that's where the center of mass is. I have a red mark, an equal distance to that red mark. On either side is where I'm going to put my weights. So I've got about, let's say I have 35 centimeters here. There we go. So 35 centimeters on this side is where I should stack these things to get some balance going. Okay, and sure enough. expect this to balance it's an unstable balance right now I just got to find out where it's approximately doing it perfect good enough so I'll prop this up here just for the picture but you can see that's very delicately balanced and I'm going to send it over to that side so it stays Check out the camera here. Go swing that over, Tad. Okay, yeah, I can see the red mark. And you can see mass and red mark are at about equal distances. Maybe if I bring this a bit closer to the edge, it would look a little more. Good enough, right? It's right on the verge of balancing. And the point is, is that the distance from this mass, perfect, the distance from that mass to the fulcrum is the same as the distance of the fulcrum to there, okay? So that was what I had demonstrated or explained the other day, and it's a really crucial point in what follows. Point is, is that we're hanging a mass from here and the mass of the board acts at its center of mass. The weight of the board, I should say. The weight acts at its center of mass. Okay, I'm gonna declare victory on having made that point. Okay. Once again. Okay, so we had certain weight, 53 newtons, and then, you know, here I had 55 newtons of weight, and these distances were almost exactly the same. That's the point. If the weights were exactly the same, the distances would be exactly the same. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about, now we have this, is Wally Wallington's Stonehenge. This is one of the most amazing videos. And remember, I asked you guys to get some good screen captures from it, whatever interests you the most. I'm going to do a careful drawing of the method by which he raised that giant cement beam. And uh, 
the video is very well made and I think the explanation and everything is very clear. What I'm just going to do is draw it and label it in terms of our concepts here. So I guess I'll make some space. I want this to be a large sketch. What works best? I want this to be a very large sketch, carefully labeled. And it's really the principle that I just demonstrated here. So this is Wallington Stonehenge. We had talked about the post and lintel construction, and he's trying to build something like this, and these things are large cement beams. Okay. They are three-dimensional, they're major. Okay. Now, here's what, we'll do, what I'll do. I'll draw this very large beam right here. tons or so and what I have to do is in the middle put this wooden cradle device of his so this is that wooden cradle device and I should actually measure this make sure we're reasonably so we're 50 centimeters here and this one should be about this long yeah that's fairly simple that's what we're looking at. And the ground is down here somewhere, right? So how does he get that thing up there? I'm just gonna show how he balances it. Now, this is symmetric, and so the center of mass of this beam is right there at the star. And the little wooden wedge that it's balanced on is that little blue wedge right there. Okay, Everything down here is filled in. I'm not worried about that. Balanced at that point. So where is the weight of the beam? The weight of the beam in all its massive tonnage is exactly here, right? If you were strong, you could hold on your finger. Just like with my ruler. Okay, It's the same principle. The weight of the ruler is right here in the middle. So the weight of the beam, I'm just going to call F1, and it's balanced on that blue wedge there, Oops. and over here there's an extra bucket of cement okay, that you can carry over there, got a handle on it, whatever. Okay. So this is the extra bucket of cement, we'll just call it a block. There we go. And it's this block here that has F2. The length of these vectors is not to scale, obviously. This one's actually much, much shorter. I'll just put it, you know, that's our F2. So we're balanced right there, and here's the key. Our lengths, we have this little one here is L1, and this big distance here um, is L2, all the way from that block out to here. So that's why this beam can be balanced so well. This is a tiny L1, and this is a giant L2. And again, it's just F2, because the law of the balance is F2 times L2 is equal to F1 times L1. F1 is the weight of the entire beam. Let's just go ahead and write all these things. F1 equals the weight of the beam, exclamation point. F2 is the weight of the bucket, which was, you know, it's kind of five gallon bucket filled with cement or something. 
over here at the side. So yeah, F2 doesn't have to be that great. It's the same thing I just did. Um, so yeah, we can just, F2 is equal to this enormous F1, plus this small L1 divided by L2. Right? This is a small number. And now you can see what he did also. You can see it mathematically, it's balanced, so been balanced, now you just bring this over there and place one of these here and tip it and you just rock the thing back and forth. Okay. So he can actually, since it's balanced, he just has to add a tiny bit more here and it will tip up. And once it tips up, he can push in the extra pivot a little bit higher and back and forth. So once you, once you control the balance, you don't need much more to unbalance it. And so he rocked this thing all the way up, okay? An amazing, amazing thing. I just wanted to make sure we, you know, have the mathematics behind this because it's very simple. And the explanation in the video is excellent so you can see exactly what happened. Good, that takes care of that. And now we're ready to move on. Let's see how we're doing time-wise. Excellent. So finally we're ready to talk about energy after all this preparation. Yeah, you can add any kind of words you want here, screen captures, etc, etc. Put them in your notes. But this is just the analysis and uh, these are often referred to as lever arms. The, or moment arms, these distances, these respective distances here. Okay, so let's go ahead and erase this. So our next concept getting into work and energy, or we're getting into energy, that's a word you've heard before. Work is what we begin with. So work is equal to what? I'm going to give the definition in a moment. I've got a bowling ball that's about 70 newtons. So instead of risking damaging my scale, I'll use a little bit of So what I'll do is I'll have 50 on that scale, and you'll see I have another 16 or 18 or 20 on this upper scale. So we're looking at roughly a 70 Newton bowling ball to try not to damage things. So what does that have to do with work? Well, the definition of work is a force times a displacement. A displacement is changing the position of something. This is going to be a one meter displacement. I can get this thing to stay there, very good. So if I lift this bowling ball one meter, then we have those 70 Newtons as a force and one meter of displacement. But for starters, let's just remember, lifting something, lifting a weight is called work, okay? So there we did some work. Let me go ahead and fill in the definition force times displacement. Now we already know what an example of a, a force is a weight, okay? And we know there's newtons. Displacement is a change of position and is measured in meters, okay? So this is a change of position and it's measured in meters, and this is a weight, an example of a force is a weight, we've learned about forces, so that's measured in newtons. So work, I'll say, is equal to F times D, and of course I can use any letters I want, and the units of the work, see when we put a square bracket around a quantity, 
we're asking what are the units? And those are the units of F and D. So that's newtons times meters. So newtons times meters, that's what work is. And it has, it gets the letter J and finally the letter J stands for joule. So the units of work are the joule. J-O-U-L-E. So force times displacement, it's doing work and you never forget this, you're lifting something, that's work. Okay. Joule. Um, so uh, I think I talked about the square brackets before, but whenever we get a new quantity, we put the square bracket around and ask what it means. In this case, it's a newton times a meter is a joule. Okay. So newtons times meter equals joule. Right? Newton meter joule. And since this was 70 newtons, one meter, 70 joules. That simple. So we have these definitions. And here's the thing. This is the unit of energy. So work is energy. Okay? And energy is what this class is supposed to be about. So we finally arrived, at least partway, what energy is. An example of energy is work, doing work, and we measure it in newtons times meters. Now I have to follow that up with a really important point. Here I'm going to mark off a meter on this plank here, and I'm gonna start at this end and carefully lift this ball over and deposit it there. So you might think I've just done 70 joules of work again, because it was 70 newtons and a meter, but someone else could say, wait a minute, you did unnecessary work because you could have just effortlessly rolled the ball across instead of doing that little shallow lift, okay? So that's essentially no work, right? This thing is just rolling across here. So the point is, is that we have to improve this definition a bit and that's why it's an important note the force and the displacement have to be parallel okay force and the displacement have to be parallel so note very important note force and displacement must be parallel And because force is a vector, it suffices to use parallel components or use parallel components components of F. I'll put vector and E. See what I did there? Force and displacement are actually vectors. We know that. Well, we know it about force, displacement too. So we could use parallel components, but yeah, we, what I just did, rolling the ball does not count as a force or as a work because the force on this ball is its weight. It's always up and down and the displacement is horizontal. So those are perpendicular, not parallel. So that's an important technical point. So we now have a definition of work. Make sure you set this up as clearly and logically as you can because I'm now going to give an example that builds on on uh, this example that I just gave. So Newton times meters, joule. Um, let me just write this in words also. Joule J is the unit of work also energy. We need to do a little bit more to give a more formal definition of energy, but we're already there, okay? Work and energy are very closely related, the same in some sense. Good, so my next demonstration is simply 
to talk about an inclined plane. So I brought a box here so I could bring this board up a bit and consult the screen here. Yeah, let's send this over here a bit. There we go. Good enough. Okay, so we've got an incline. I'm going to roll something up a hill, for example. And I'm going to set this back enough to have the ball in front as well. So, set this back on my table. There we go. So there's our incline. And we can measure this with a ruler if we need to and see what that looks like. Good. That looks good enough. Get some of this out of the way. Okay. And plus we have a ruler if we want to measure with. So here's the thing. I can do two things, and of course I'm going to draw this as a picture as well, and then demonstrate it. demonstration I can label this all my heart's content. So we have a incline. I'm even gonna put a shelf on the edge of the incline. And we wanna we wanna get the bowling ball to the top of the incline. And then we'll store it up there but I'm just gonna hold it right here. So here are two methods of getting the bowling ball to the top of the incline. One person might say, hey, I'll just roll it to the end, this thing isn't that heavy, and then we'll pick it up and place it here. Done deal, okay. So we did a certain amount of work, the rolling doesn't count, and then we lifted it, you know, we lifted it some number of centimeters here. I'm saying I lifted about 20, 22 centimeters, okay. The other method is just to start at the bottom of the board and roll it up to the top, okay. So in both cases we did work. Here we did a short piece of heavy work and here we did an easy piece of light work because it was very easy to roll up. And the ratio is about 20 centimeters high and, you know, almost two meters long. Good, I'll place that here as a visual. And now let's analyze what we did here. So work is force times displacement. F times D. And we know we've got the weight and then the parallel displacement. So there are two ways to do it. The one method is just to roll the ball and then lift it all at once, okay? And I'll say that height is H, so the D is gonna be H in this case. And on the second case, as I roll this thing up, the parallel component of the force, you know, the weight is pushing down, but since it's a vector, there's a parallel component. That's the one here. That's the parallel component of the displacement. And then I roll it up here, and then my displacement is that direction. Here's that point. Here's the point. Both times I'm doing the same amount of work. So I have work in my demonstration. The one method is equal to the second method. So I'll even call this a two, and I'll call this a one, 
So I have, I've got F1, H1 is equal to F2, and I'm just going to call this distance B2. Okay. So this here is F2. It's just this little short force but the distance is long. You're seeing it's just like the law of the balance, the law of the lever. This is the law of the incline. We're not going to have to memorize these laws um, in that sense, but we do want to realize that roll it over here for free and then do a short lift is the same as an easy force over a long distance. Okay. Big force, short distance, small force, larger distance. You may want to put that in words, people. Left side is the large force times a small distance equals a small force times a large distance. That again is mechanical advantage. That's the inclined plane. And lifting things is the most basic form of work. There will be many more um, examples as we go through with the material. I'm going to consult the clock again. Okay, I'm going to just about wrap things up here. This is the really principal point that we're making right here. We've got force times displacement. So I'm going to leave off with a couple of words on this. We've got this demonstration here. So the definition of energy, and we're going to add to this, but this is the first version, energy, okay. Energy is the capacity to do work. Just add a good definition of work. Energy is the capacity to do work. And all of our forms of energy are going to be tied into this as we as we go through the semester. What we're going to do next is talk about energy, then work, then power, which I'm not going to introduce today. Energy, work, power. I'll give some mechanical examples. Um, and that'll kind of end a certain segment of the, of the lecture. So we'll leave it here. We've got energy capacity to do work. Next time we're going to do some numerical examples of these things, but you never forget, it's just lifting something up. You lift something, you did some work. Your body weight, um, a stair climb, all those examples I'll do next time, just running up a flight of stairs, there's a good example of work and power which we'll get to next time. Until then, see you later.